mind and to regulate and recalibrate our soul. As I bow with you, I'm praying for those who have sickness. I'm praying for those in mental crises. I'm praying for those in financial crunch, I'm praying for those who are on their jobs experiencing chaos and challenge, I'm praying for marriages, I'm praying for ministries. I'm praying for churches open all over the land and world and those who are near shutting doors for the very reason. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would be the sovereign escort, shepherding us through tonight. I pray for my Aunt Martha, who just had surgery, and I pray for those who just suffered loss in my fraternity. I pray for those who are tuned in all across the land and country, those, Lord, standing in the need of a significant miracle in aspects that we wouldn't even fathom. I pray for shaking, and broken chains to get the fetters and also the shackles off of their feet and hands. I pray for those who are in bitterness based on real problems that have attacked their lives that they can identify and also itemize as causing woe. I pray, pleading the blood, that we have a phenomenal time in your word tonight, today, this morning, this afternoon. I pray, Lord, that we don't miss nor pigeonhole what you're about to do. But it, we need a raw encounter and a hunger and thirst for righteousness so that you will see your son lifted in our hearts as he was lifted on the cross. And even through our very life, you will draw all men unto you, creating each of us a clean heart, new a right spirit, help us to find peace that even surpasses earthly understanding. Bid us come on the water of faith where you're at work. Keep us in the hollow of your hand when our grip slips and enable us, Lord God, to taste and see of your until our soul erupts with her boast. We ever needed you before, we sure need you right now. Speak, your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And thank God. Thank God. Bless you. Bless you all who are tuning in. I want to turn your attention to two places of scripture. And these two primary locales will give us insight. But do and rarely entertain because we assume so much about this topic. We have found ourselves too often complacent and comfortable in this particular subject matter. So I'd ask that you will be open to receive what God is going to say to you afresh and that you will tune your heart to the beat of God's drum. What are the two passages? They are Matthew chapter 13 verses 45 and 46 and then Psalms Matthew chapter 13, verse 45 through 46, and then Psalm 63. Give you time to go to those places and put a finger in both and prepare to see God high and lifted and the train of his glory fill your temple. Here we go. Matthew chapter 13. Look at verse 45 and 46. Bible says heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Now put in your chat, put in your text a costly pearl. 
And I want you to let that just marinate in your heart. I want that to just stir in your spirit, a costly pearl. Matthew 13, verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of a fine pearl, costly. And upon finding a single pearl of great value, he went and sold and bought the pearl. I'm going to repeat that, Matthew 13. When you get that passage, just send it out through all of your social media, across all of your texts. Let it be known that we are looking for a costly pearl. When you send that out, somebody's going to give you a phone call and a text. What pearl? They're going to think you thought they stole your stuff. <laughs> You're just saying, I'm in search of something that is more than the world to me. Matthew only records this snippet. Observe in this illustration of a common thing, a familiar thing to the abstract, which is a holy thing. Matthew only says, observe in this parable that the merchant is accustomed to deal in pearls. This merchant is no novice it's not not somebody that's johnny come lately the merchant deals in pearls and is searching for good ones not your everyday ordinary throwaway not the costume jewelry that i stole from my grandma when i was a child and presented to gwendolyn brooks at gates elementary school and got the worst whooping of my life not those costume jewelry items this this merchant <laughs> when he with one worth more than the others he possesses all put together. In the form of parable, here's what's going on. The merchant is described as one who finds the gospel as it were by chance. But here, this speaks of one who has long been searching for the truth and has had counterfeit encounters prior to finding this. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant, a man, evidently no poor man available and able to find a rich but according to this experience he has nothing that can be compared to what he finds when he finds the pearl of great cost and because all his other possessions were inferior the man aimed high he got more than he could have thought possible mm. Can I just say to you that in our pursuit, we're talking about the art of worship. And it's a desire to get more than you bargained for. It's a desire for exceedingly abundantly above all you've ever asked, thought, or imagined. It's a costly pearl, a pearl of great price that we want to have access to and take possession of. One that earnestly seeks is who God is after in this power hour. One who is clawing and pressing toward a mark of the high call, who goes about from every city across all the country and all over the land seeking goodly and beautiful pearl, jewels that cannot be compared. Thus the sacred writer wisdom and true religion as a costly jewel the gospel of jesus christ is what we ought to pursue and today i want to talk about worship the art of worship and true worship the writers who bring us the message and in this particular case matthew chapter 13 verse 45 through 46 knows the exceeding great value of the good news of the gospel and as well knowing he would be a great gainer though he should part with all his possessions the merchant to buys one pearl gets rid of all the things that he had recognizing there's no comparison to what he's pursuing that the treasure hid in the field that gospel that we ought to claw after because 
we've looked all over the land and couldn't find anything that would satisfy as we want to be thrilled, chilled, and filled only in what God provides can we find it. Here's the summation of Matthew chapter 13, 45 through 46. When we talk about the art of worship, the man has been seeking the holiness and truth and has found them in a le le least uh, than lower form in his pursuit. Then he's led to the higher knowledge that it is only in Jesus Christ that we can live, move, and have our being. And for that, is content to give up everything else he possesses. This is what the New Testament is calling us to. And Paul is one who helps us with Matthew and says all things are but loss for the excellency of the knowledge we are called to have the art of worship and it's the thirsting soul that can be satisfied only in God. Question on the floor, will you give up everything you have to find hope against all hope in God and God alone? Psalm 63 says, here's a challenge with Matthew 13, oh God, I want you to be mine. And with the deepest longing, earnestly I seek you. My soul longs for you, thirsts for you with no water. I have gazed upon you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. In Psalm number 63, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. So will I bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul, my life, my very self is satisfied as with the marrow and the fatness and my mouth offers praise to you with joyful lips alone. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate and watch this day and night for you have been my help and in the shadow of your wings where I am always protected, I'm gonna sing for joy. My soul, my life, my very self clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Stop right there. What is the art of worship? I'll sum it up in three words, pursuit of God. Matthew 13 tells us it's the pearl of great price. Pursuit of God. Psalm 63 says, that is my sole objective. Oh, that I might know. That I would have him in my personal jurisdiction, not as a possession, but as a possession. Y'all miss that. I don't just want to claim I own God because no one does, but I want to be possessed by God because he will supply every need. There's an art of worship. Search all over the world. Try love in all the wrong places, if you will or may, and you will discover no one can provide for you the way that the creator who has knitted you and who formed you provides for you. Pursuit of God is what scripture says is mandatory if you're going to know the art of worship. We're going to worship something. We're gonna elevate something. We're gonna clap our hands towards something and bow our head towards something. Some it's their personhood, others it's their career, somebody else's material gain. And to another, you've esteemed the presidential office and your favorite candidate, as well as your affiliation in politics as your God. To others, America, the continental is to and God says all of those are wrong perspectives and foci. Pursuit of God is what scripture says is mandatory. You are invited to think deeply about your faith in this power hour. You are invited to come alive to God's presence surrounding, to his sustaining and pursuing you. 
When I say pursuit of God, we think it's us clamoring upward, trying to get to who God is, but God knew enough about our psyche and our fair-weathered faith that he came pursuing us from heaven to earth in the likeness of man. He came to model what it looks like to have love and life abundant. He came to give us agape, unconditional favor and mercy and unmerited favor and grace. Pursuit of God is mandatory. Why, Mike Satterfield? Because it leads you to the only one who can satisfy your soul. Your soul must crave to be fulfilled and you try to get it from a spouse and they disappoint it. Your soul longs to be fulfilled and you try to your career has subsided and left you bankrupt. Your soul is longing to be whole and you sought it in raising gremlins, I mean children, and the children have rejected, forsaken, and turned a deaf ear to being close to you. Pursuit of God is mandatory because it leads you to the only one who can satisfy the soul. A.W. Tozer writes a book, The Pursuit of God. I hold it for the Zoomers in my hand, Pursuit of God, A.W. Tozer. And Tozer tasted thee, and it has both satisfied me and made me thirsty for more. <laughs> That's the art of worship. When you taste God and see that he's better than Campbell's soup, he's mm -mm good. When you taste of God and see that he's a way maker, a mind regulator, a bridge over troubled waters. When you taste God and see he's so costly that you will sell all you own and invest all you have in the presence of the most high. And not just A.W. Tozer, but Johnny Erickson Tata, to truly reflect the love of God. As we pursue God, we must go all in a search and destroy mission to uproot every sin that comes against God. We must go all in in a search and destroy mission, small and great, lurking in the heart to find the sins that so easily beset us. We must snuff out every secret transgression and sniff out every hidden fault. That tries to disguise itself as acceptable in our We let that be acceptable. I only got a little upset and we let that become acceptable. And Johnny Erickson Tata says, no, we need to snuff it and sniff it and bring it under obedience to Christ. We need to demolish every stronghold. We must eschew, which means to avoid, to shun, to abstain and keep away from evil as the necessary dealing with rootlessness that sin brings. Elmer L. Towns says, as a young man, I had determined to hear why, because I wanted to touch their God. But more importantly, I wanted their God, who became my God, to touch me. The art of worship is to thirst with a soul satisfied in God. The art of worship is pursuit of God that is mandatory. The art of worship is to taste of him and know that he is who satisfies your total longing. The art of worship is to demolish everything that rises up against God to cause our minds to be clouded. The art of worship is the pursuit of God where I want to be touched by him as I want to touch him myself. That's why Matthew 13 says he's the pearl of great price. Get rid of everything that cannot measure up and focus solely to the hills from which comes your health and strength. Scripture says, seek first the king and his kingdom because he's worked the search. And while you're at it, 
Psalm 63 says, God, your mind, that's why I deeply long for you. You are purposeful. You are prayer personified. And I know you bring peace. What's the art of worship? Pursuit of God instead of religion. Somebody type amen. Because pursuing God instead of religion turns a directionist dry Christ follower into a joy filled, passionate worshiper. I worship. I don't want to be dry. I don't want to be milk toast. I don't want to be impotent. I don't want to just go to church. I need to be the church, possess my worship, seeking his face, turning from my wicked ways, knowing he hears me relationally and not just in religiosity. He forgives all the stuff I've done wrong in my life. And then he brings the healing we prayed for in the beginning of the power hour. Art of worship is the pursuit of God, which we must get on board. Pursuing God must become the end of life as we've known it. So from this day forward, I'm challenging everybody who's at power hour to not look like you did. Pursuit of God, the art of worship, I'm challenging you to die to self so that Christ can live on in your life. Just tonight, just today, just for this moment, I want you to consider surrendering all. I want you to give up your rights. The end of your life as you've known it. Because many of you are dissatisfied with even the good stuff you've accomplished thus far. The art of worship, pursuing God, makes us read the Bible slowly. Watch this meditatively hear me entering the spirit in like psalm 63 has been written it means allowing always the seeking of the face of god as we read until we stop reading the bible and the bible starts reading us mm -hmm. i said it somebody missed it mm -hmm. The art of worship is the pursuit of God, which makes us read the Bible slowly, meditatively, earnestly, reading it until the spirit of every passage and every number becomes what we live in and take nourishment from. We don't live by you today, but we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God always seeking the face of God when you read and not just finishing your Bible studies lesson, not just getting a sermon prepared, not just making sure you could teach your Sunday school class. You're not studying just to say you've got learning. You're studying not even to memorize the word only. You're studying to know the word and obey the word because a lot of us can memorize it and never look like what we read. But when you stop reading it after you earnestly the face of God in it, then the Bible starts reading us. And it would be a mistake, hear me, to hurry through this Bible and this Bible studies. God wants us not to rush through the art of worship. He wants us to pursue him with reckless abandon. The rest of Psalm number 63 says, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate and thoughtfully focus on you day and night. For you have been my help and you've been in the shadow of wing, the one protecting me. I sing with joy, my soul, my life, my whole self. Seek my life to destroy it will be destroyed because you're on my side. They will go into the depths of the earth, into the underworld because God is protecting me. They will be given over to the power of the sword. They will be a prey for foxes, but the king will rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him, honoring the true God, acknowledging his authority and majesty will glory. For the mouths of those who speak lies will be stopped. And I share this story often if my two children, one of which is on this and tell me someone's done them dirty, 
I will have to visit that someone because this is my child. This is my baby. And they're crying and they're upset. Somebody did them wrong. And I just want to have them. I'm a nice guy. I want to have a meeting with somebody that did them wrong. And they'll let me know, well, you know, I was just playing. And I will snatch your heart out your chest, eat it in front of you, watch you collapse and perish, and then preach your funeral. Because you've messed with my offspring. And I know that sounds morbid. That sounds very, very ungodly. But don't mess with my children. How much more will the God of heaven protect you as his own the bible says the king will rejoice in that god and everyone who swears by his name will know his authority and majesty and will glory because he'll turn your enemy into your footstool and he'll let you mount on wings of an eagle run not be weary and today walk and not faint somebody shouted to the rooftops the art of worship and while you're at it, go ahead and tell it like it is. It's the pursuit of God. Pursuing God brings only after praying and meditating on the word itself with a spirit of longing. You come to the Bible with a ready heart and not just an academic pursuit. You're not getting nothing it's from the word of God in order to debate and argue with other people. It is with determination you go to the word to know God. Otherwise, it will be like any other pursuit. You won't have effect and you won't have potency if you come to the word just because it's your habit. I want scripture and I ought to want to open it every day because only what we do for God through his son Christ even lasts. I've done a whole, I've studied extra engineering. I've, I've been to the academic realm and I'm even now tampering in some secular coaching, but I want you to know no one can escape the all seeing eye of God. I heard on an international call with 73 leaders from all over the world that they've discovered the platinum rule of management and leadership and I asked what's your platinum rule they said do unto others that you have them do unto you I said that's the bible so all the second I may not be with them coaching long because I had to let the secular world know you have stolen from scripture what you call a platinum rule pursue God because even the world is looking for this art of worship that you have ready access to A.W. Tozer in the same book, The Pursuit of God says, I expect in pursuing the God of glory to show that if we know the power of the Christian message, our nature must be invaded by that capital object. That that must become internal, meaning God must come within that the objective reality, which is God, must cross the threshold of our personality and take residence within. Oh, that's real old English, lofty conversation. But here's the translation. We must become men and women who know God so closely that we live in him as a bird lives in the air. Solomon, I'm gonna let that sink in that I would know God so closely and intimately that I would be like a fish in water. Natural habitat. I soar with the eagle. I float with the dolphin. I'm in my natural element when I'm wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up with God. I'm pursuing him with every move I make, every step I take. It's the art of real worship. I don't know what y'all do at your church services. I don't know what you do when you call yourself in worship. I don't know what you're really about the business of, but we must be men and women who stop dabbling in the passing trends, winds, and doctrines of our day and in realities of God's truth, which never changes. He's the same, come on somebody, yesterday, today, and forever, yet we're pursuing the temporal 
and the microwavable when we have the eternal and the soul satisfying. The art of worship is the pursuit of God, which is bathed in simply Jesus Christ, who's the solution for today's church. When you try to figure out what's wrong with the church, Jesus is missing. What's wrong with today's church? The church doesn't look like Jesus. It's not contemporary versus traditional. It's not if you've got us four no more. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. He is simply the solution for today's church. So pursuing God and the art of worship and in today's church, the difference between the art of worship and stage programs is that we've been consumed with holy desires. What's the difference between the art of worship and stage program? Our world. The difference with true worship pursuing God is holy desire. I want him and I can't do nothing without him. I need him every hour, every nanosecond of every day. The art of worship is the hunger for God himself, not his treasures. Stop right there. We've been pursuing what he can give us instead of pursuing him who gives us all good and perfect gifts. If I got God, I've got it all. And the art of worship is the hunger for God himself, not his treasures, and to thirst for God himself, never being satisfied till we drink deep at the fountain of living water that only God himself can provide. A woman went to a well and argued about how her forefather dug in the well. And Jesus said, I am the well. If you drink from me, you'll never thirst again. That's digging deep, drinking deep in the fountain of living water. In other words, the art of worship is desiring God above. Are you guilty? Does that describe you? We hear much about desiring God, but I see little manifest presence of God in people's lives. Oh, we talk much about going to church but I see little that's unusual about your personal life as a believer to indicate that you've met with the Messiah. Nobody's wearing a veil because you hadn't been on the mount supping with him to the degree you got to glow when you come off the mount. Something now is so strange about you that the world took note that you've been with Jesus. Those disciples of old, the world knew, were unlearned men who had turned the world upside down. And they were uncommon because they loved so recklessly as well as unconditionally. And that's not reckless in the negative. That's lavish in their desire to take care of one of another. We hear so much about desiring God, but see so little about his manifest presence. Can you relate? Unity? Has your worship service depleted and sent people out and transformed every corner where crime has had to be ceased and people around you have been raised from their dead thinking and dead living? I went to a mega church and we had a huge conference and at the mega church and the huge conference, everybody pep rally got fired up. We learned three steps to a breakthrough and five back flips to a miracle. And when I went across the street to the mall and I asked someone from a foreign land that worked one of the cellular phones, what did they know about Jesus? And they said, who? The church across the street, 24,000 people just released everybody out of the building turning black backflips and running up and down the parking lot, but the mall had need of salvation and folk who worked there regularly had never heard of Jesus. What are we doing? 
what kind of art of worship are we participating in? Can you relate? Because here's the scandal. It is scandalous in the kingdom while actually seated at the father's table in a Sunday service at church. If you go in more hungry when you leave the service than you were when you entered in, you sat at a table that gave you kibbles and bits. That's dog food instead of the filet mignon of the gospel. Or we slather gravy over a sermon, hoop holler, or we articulate with the finest of acumen and linguistics, but we leave drier than we went in. And then somebody makes our wood wet so that the hungry sheep look up and are not fed. And Jesus told Peter, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, I love thee. Feed my lambs. Do you love me? And finally, Peter, on the third question of the same question, had to say, only you know. Because the sheep were not getting fed while sitting at the father's table. Across the canvas and across the landscape, sisters, of this world I travel in preaching, the art of worship has been lost entirely. And in its place has come the strange, listen to this, and foreign thing we call the church program. Where is that in your Bible? Oh, we got another program. The Women in Red, the Deacon Society, the Mission Group program, the pastor's anniversary, the pastor's pre-anniversary, the pastor and wife celebration. We've got the church homecoming, a program for children, a program for youth, a program for college, a program for senior adults. And program is a word borrowed from the performance stage. Public service, which now passes for worship among us. God didn't call us to a program. He called us to people. I feel like I'm all by myself now on this Zoom and this conference call. It's silent, even if y'all on mute. But the art of worship is the pursuit of God by the people, not in a program, but through the pages of scripture. The Bible is a means to bring men to an intimate, listen, and satisfying knowledge of God that they may enter into him, that they may delight in taste and know the inner sweetness of the very God himself in the core and center of their heart. When was the last time you came up, filled to the full from studying to show yourself approved? Or did you just say you went to the Bible study fellowship, which is a parish church entity where many gather men and women to study the Bible and they go deep, they go intense. But if you leave the Bible study fellowship, BSF, and you still out cursing the folk on the corners of miss what the study was all about. It's not just getting academic, it's getting anointed. The Bible used in the art of worship is not composed of just mere words that nourish the soul, but it affords us the opportunity to meet with the God himself who nourished and feeds us. He leadeth me, he leadeth me. By his own hand, he leadeth me. Oh, faithful follower, I will be. By God's own hand, that's who leads me. Makes us aware when we find God in personal experience, our fire for him may not be initially as large as your neighbor's, but it's as real as your neighbor. And if you got fire personally from meeting with God, then your fire is able to set a flame somebody else's candle. I said a whole lot there. Your intimate relationship with God ought to be one whereby you let your light so shine, men see good works, and then they're set ablaze. 
John Wesley was asked how he was so influential in America, a revival that started a real generational transformation. And John Wesley said, I just set my life on fire and the world comes and watches me burn. That's the art of worship. I'm so caught up in the most high that others around me will be able to praise him. That if a mosquito bites you, it has to sing nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let your light so shine, saints, that men see good works and they glorify God. The art of worship is personal and conscious. That is, you and I have the capacity to know God and to have found God and still pursue him is the soul's glorious desire. The heart's happy exploration of the infinite riches in the Godhead. I don't get enough when I find it. I want it even more. Let some drops now fall on me, even me. Open it up, God. Pour out the window of blessing. How do I develop this heart of worship? If it's the pursuit of God, if it's Matthew 13, 45 and 46, if it's Psalm 63, if it's me understanding that I have to let my light shine, how do I develop a heart of worship? Well, again, I agree with A.W. Tozer who says, come near to the holy men and women of the past and you will soon feel the heat of their desire after God. What does that mean? The early men and women of the Bible mourned for him. Do you? They him day and night. Do you? The men and women of the Old Testament and early disciples in the New Testament looked for God in season and out. And when they found him, the finding was more sweet than the longing they had. Come here, Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping endures for a long night. And the weeping is the seeking of the Lord to come intercede. But the Bible says joy comes when? In the morning. And the joy is the sweeter thing of seeing your long night of weeping. Your suffering pales in comparison to the glory of having met with God and seeing him bring to you peace. Now I wrote this down and this ought to resonate with somebody. I've heard it all in Christian schools and I've heard it all in many a Sunday service, but have you listened with your heart? All of it. I've heard enough is often exclaimed and I'm not moved or impressed and hungry. You listen Jesus style. And Jesus said, my food is to do the will of my father and to finish what he's called me to be and do. When God's word becomes a lamp to your feet and a light to your pathway, then John 4, 34, God becomes your food, becomes your testimony. That's when you want more of him and more is not even enough. When your speech and conversation always is laced with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know every man, you've come to the place where the art of worship is the pursuit of God in every footstep you take. Moses used the fact that he knew God as an argument for knowing him better. And God delighted in Moses and his pursuit of him to the degree his glory passed by Moses in the cleft of the rock. Why? Because Moses said, I beseech thee, show me your glory. Anybody pray that prayer this morning? Or did you say, give me a good parking spot at my job? sure I get to the grocery store and, and get the, the last soft loaf of bread. 
did you have God on your agenda or was it something petty? David's life in Psalms rings with the cry of the seeker and the glad shout of the finder. <laughs> That's what we see in Psalm 63. Oh God, you're my God. With the deepest longing, I'm seeking you earnestly. My soul will delight in you like with the richest of food. Wet me with worship, wet me with wonder, wet me with your will. Clinging for God, craving him. And Paul says, I'm not going to be undone by Moses or David. Paul confessed in Philippians 3, 8, that I may know him is my pursuit. That's my goal. That's my heartbeat. And to this, he sacrificed everything. I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And I count those things as dung, as refuse, that I may win Christ. Oh, I just want to see a church rise up at this power. Him everything. I'm giving him my sorrows. I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. I'm giving him my pain. I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. I'm giving him my burdens. I'm giving him this hiccup that has come into my life that was not anticipated, that has got me out my rhythm and has been a monkey wrench in my progress. But I am giving him even those things that have gone bump in my night so that I can have belief against all things, that he would cause all things to work together for good because I love him. Here's the problem. We have been snared, which insists that if we have found God, we need no more seek him. We already got him. Have you been to that church that says, now that you say, sit down? Now that you got baptized, you good? Now that you become a member, we're fine. How tragic that we further in this dark day have had our seeking done by those who are our teachers instead of us seeking God for ourselves. What does that mean? We are a hallmark congregation where if the words are not on the screen, we don't. We need somebody else to write the lyrics. We need somebody else to do the research. We need someone else to do the heavy lifting. And then we'll discover or find if we're okay with what they've done. The art of worship is the pursuit of God that does not let one rock cry out in a worshiper's place. Because if you don't praise him personally, if you don't praise him consciously, if you don't praise him urgently, God will let a rock cry out right in front of you and give his glory. And I personally, out in my place, ask for me in my house, we going to have the art of worship that praises the Lord. I personally and I consciously want to taste. I personally and consciously want to touch with my heart. I personally and consciously want to see with my eyes the wonder that is God. That's my holy desire. Because the difference between the art of worship and a stage program is holy desire. I can do a program and it becomes mechanical and sterile, or I can pursue dealing with people who are flawed and watch God change a mess into that which he will bless. That God will take a tragedy and turn it into a testimony because I dare to leave 99 and go after one person that did not know him. And they will fight me because drowning men will fight a rescuer. But my whole intent, because I've been rescued and blessed, is to be a rescuer that bless is. The art of worship in the pursuit of God is the understanding, right? Instagrammable. This is conference callable. This is zoomable. The art of worship in the pursuit of God is the understanding that he, God, waits to be wanted. Wow. 
He doesn't force himself on us. He waits to be wanted. And the further scandal is that it's too bad that with many of us, he waits in vain. Because we are caught up in our and our methods. We're caught up in our organization and we're caught up in a world that's full of activity, which occupy time and attention, but can never satisfy the longing of the heart. There are a lot of busy churches that are not blessed. There's a whole lot of activity that's bankrupt because God didn't send you to do the thing you planned to do that he never endorsed. And you wonder why you're exhausted and doing something for God. There are people right now who are out of order and out of position. Or they lag behind his will. And they're shallow. And they're hollow. And they are slaves imitating the world and missing true worship. Let me see if I can help us. Here's the art of worship. We need to today simplify our approach to God if we're really gonna pursue him. Because now as always, babes suffer the children to come unto me we ought to just simplify and approach him as a baby would and you know what he does while he gives himself to those who are in child heart humble he hides himself in the darkness from folk who think they got it all understood confounding those who think they got wisdom simplify your pursuit and hunger after him as a babe would. We must put away all effort to impress and come with it. And if we do this, without doubt, God is about to respond. Soldier says the evil habit of seeking God and something else prevents us from finding God in full revelation because we got something else that's in our view. God plus something else is aiming too short. And if we omit God and, we shall soon find God and God alone. <laughs> find that for which we have always been longing. He's it. If somebody's right now afraid if I, if, I, if I don't get this other and, and all I seek is God, then I'm going to prevent myself from being what I want to be and getting what I want. No. The Pearl of Great Price says, sell everything you got. Because he's worth that kind of pursuit. Psalm 63 says, that you with your weary soul ought to pursue him with everything and enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy in your life. We pursue God because and only because he has first pursued us. No man comes to me, says the word from the Lord, except the Father which has sent me draws him. He came after us first. And it's by this very proceeding that God initiated that he takes full credit for our act of worship coming back to him. He says, my right hand in Psalm 63 upholds you as you pursue me. And this divine upholding and then our human following of God gives us the place where, write this down, God seeks us and births in us God seekers. God seeks us 
And what he births in us as initiating the romance is a God seeker. And I close with three minutes and counting with John 17, three. The goal of religion, because he pursues us first, is in essence the response of the creation to the creator who is God. He comes after us like a deer pants for water. My soul lifts up to him because he's pursuing me when I didn't have it in mind to go after him. The response of the creature to the creator, the created personality to the creating personality. Those God has brought forth from the dust to the one who is the divine. And John 17, three sums up the art of worship, which is the pursuit of God. The Bible says, don't stop at Matthew 13, 45 and 46. The Bible says, don't stop at Psalm 63, knowing that the king will lift up the name and be glorified. Come to John 7, it says, this is life eternal. This is eternal life, that they might know God, the only true God and his son, Jesus Christ, whom God has sent. True worship is pursuing the one who has come for us and that brings eternal life, period. Bringing power, glory to God. Amen, powerful. Tell you, it, uh, it's truly amazing what he's capable of doing when we pursue him. Come on. What 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 I've taken away from this mic tonight is that basically I have been blind to the bread. When I say Damn. blind to the bread, give me this, give me each this day my daily bread. My daily portion is enough. And sometimes in our lack of pursuing him, we choose choosing what he's given us day by day because he knows what we need. He knows exactly what we need. And then when we depend solely on him, that's when he does exceedingly abundantly above what we can ask or imagine. So I'm striving hard not to be blind to the bread, man. He becomes our food. Yes, he, he is our food. He becomes our sustenance. What would it look like if everyone in this Zoom and call gave him the very best they had to offer? Your body. And so. Yeah. There he is. So when your soul thirsts, like David said, and your and your and your your flesh longs. That's, that's, that's deep pursuit. Come on. That's a total sacrifice. When your body aches for him and cries out. Hallelujah. Good word. Glory. The church is going to sleep. And that is not to dog the bride of Christ but that is to awaken this group to know that God is on the throne and he's wanting the world to be impacted and you have been chosen. I'm calling everyone under the sound of my voice off the bench, out of critique. Yes, there are things that aren't right around us, but we'll be the solution. We'll be the example. We're going to be those that the world can see have met with God and something is you.
upon someone to beg the question that I'm praying for you this week that asks, what have you done to yourself? What's different about you? And it won't be your new hairdo. It won't be your new bifocals. It won't be that you got a mani-pedi. It won't be because you're wearing cologne and got on a new fresh shirt. It will be you having the glow. Art of worship in pursuit of God that says, I found him and I want more. We, we need, to, need to sell it, give it up. Give it up, give it up. Say that again. That's not just your material it, stuff. Some of y'all get stuck in, oh, I got to give my car. They're telling me to give up my house and be on skid row. No, sell all the junk within you. Amen. So that you can have the deposit of the freshness of the fullness of Hallelujah. the Godhead. Hallelujah. Well, and that's rich. You know, God is so amazing because he's more concerned with what you have than what you need. And he can use what, what you need fails in comparison. Look at Elijah and what he did, Elijah and what he did in, in, in the book of Kings, where he said, just fill those jars up with oil. Mm. I have nothing but empty jars in my house. And it was an overflow and abundance. So there are things that we have in our very own house that he can use where it'll overflow and pour out. And we don't want to have room to receive it. Good word. Let me cover it. Yeah. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for your revival. I thank you for this word. Yes, Lord. I thank you that it's potent and it's deep. Yes. And I thank you that it's not one that's just so user friendly that others get goosebumps. We have to consider and we have to gain understanding. Hallelujah. We have to war with the yes. stuff that wants us to turn a deaf ear to pursuing you only, yes. pursuing you with all. Pursuing you like there's nothing else. Pursuing you at the stake of bringing ourself to death and knowing that you're worth our rights being, Father God, forsaken. I've tried a lot of things, been a lot of places. And only you truly fulfill. Now I go with you, God, where you designed for me to be and go. And I thank you for this time. Thank you, Jesus. The, the excess debris. So we will be a masterpiece put on the mantle of the world for the world to see you are real and your reward of those who seek your face. Yeah. And the reward is not more of your stuff, it's more of you. For any been weeping through the night, I pray this is a morning joy conversation. For those who have been looking for love, I pray that you become enough to the degree that they become attractional to those that I pray we stop comparing our fire to the person's fire next to us <laughs> and understand both fires are just as real. Hallelujah. And as a candle are waiting to be lit yes. because we've been set ablaze. Thank you, Jesus. May the world see the veil removed right and now. the glow from this meeting. And may the world know yes. that we have been with the deliverer. Hallelujah. And may those closest to us see the change. Right. May it start in our house. For your satisfying presence. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God.
Blessings to you, Amen. Zoomers. Amen. Amen. There's a question, y'all, just come through. How can we ask God for more if we aren't thankful for what we already have? My Lord. For him. Yes. Well, <laughs> greedy folk who are entitled as well as believing that they're owed something. They already possess in pursuit of what they think they're missing. Mm -hmm. That's where the enemy lied to Adam and Eve yes. in telling them that God is withholding something from you if you can't eat of the tree of good and evil. They already had it in the garden. They had everything they needed in the garden. And in mm -hmm. the midst of them being duped and deceived by the evil one, they thought the goodness of God wasn't good enough because he was keeping something from them. He was keeping them from hurt, harm, and danger is what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the overflow. Thank you for the overflow, Lord. Amen. Yes. Someone's asking. A recommendation for a daily Bible study. What? Anybody being enriched by a daily Bible study that you're doing that you'd like to recommend? Man. I got one for you, Jay Fred, if you're ready. It's one that my wife has challenged our family with. I'm going to post right now in the chat. And it's the Proverbs 31 study. Mm. That's to read a proverb a day for the next 31 days. You can message me and I'll give you the breakdown on how you attack it. 31 days in Proverbs, a chapter a day. And that Bible study will read you and not you just reading it. First chapter says the fear is in knowledge, the reverence, not the spooking, but the reverence of God. Fools despise such learning. Well, that's my challenge. Instead of an extra biblical study that tackles the Bible, go straight to Proverbs and begin relentlessly. Is that um, a book you're reading or is it just something you're doing on your own? It is what you can be encouraged to do on your own and bring accountability alongside of you. In the study, you're asking God, what do you want to teach me? What do you want me to avoid? And I'll break that down. If you message me, I'll give you the fine-tuned mm -hmm. directive. Oh, you, you don't you don't have to do that. I just didn't know if there was like a, a good study that anybody's doing. Like I've done some Sheila Turnage, um, and those are good ones. And I just Priscilla, Priscilla Schreier is beautiful in what she does as well. This okay. though is straight out of the word before you even get back to those others. I want to challenge you. Yeah, you. Proverbs is great. So yeah, that'll be a good one. Okay, My thank wife you. wife just put something in the chat that she's been studying. It's a great study. So that's another recommendation as well. Good question. All right, family. Love to all of you. Thank you for being among us. Oh, here's a word. Thank you so much for today's powerful message. Two powerful statements is that Bible study is not about academics, but anointing. Also the pursuit of God is that God waits to be wanted. Mm -hmm. So that's a takeaway that in mm -hmm. the chat, brother Alonzo, another frat brother has received dropping on the power hour while he's at work. What a mighty God. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for those who are having to do it around other activity. It is meaningful and it is life transformative. We're not doing this just as an exercise 
and something else to put on the plate. I pray diving in the word makes you yes. come up a bold yeah. witness for the glory of God. Amen. Much love. Thank you, Rhonda, for seamless. Others, keep in step. Till we meet again. Need anything betwixt and in between, do not hesitate to give me a shout. Mm -hmm. Bless him. Thank you. Bless him. Amen. Awesome. Amen. Again. Much love. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Be safe and be blessed. Amen. Amen. Good night. I see a little one on the that Shawana's daughter. Hello. Welcome. Keep hey, hey. <laughs> Brother Lane, thank you for that promotion of tonight, too. Stoking invitation. Amen. If we tuned in late, but uh, better late than ever. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, Y'all have a good night. Hug that family for me, Delane. Derek, right. Good Want to see say you. Say hello. Hey, hey, how are you, girl? Hey. Oh, y'all all in the midst. Miss Shana. Thank you for checking on our brother as well. Yeah, there he is. Mm. All right. Blessings. Good night, y'all.